Greetings, hacksters! Today we are talking to Glenn Akins, who is an inventor and creator of human input devices, as well as a, a bike enthusiast, mountain bike enthusiast. And also you were just telling me about an initiative that you helped push through around bringing broadband to everybody in your locality. Exactly. So I live in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. We're known for all of our microbreweries. We're known for our mountain biking and soon we're going to be known for our broadband. Um, beers, bikes, and broadband. <laughs> as I like to claim it. Um, the city of Loveland, the city of Fort Collins, Est and Estes Park um, over the past three, four years had uh, really uh, stepped forward to make sure that the entire city, uh, the residents of all their cities are connected. And the city of Fort Collins is in the process right now of installing some metric gigabit fiber connections to every single house in the city. So we're using this gigabit fiber that uh, my friends and I lobbied for two, three years ago to uh, make this live stream happen today. That is so cool. Yeah. And speaking of the live stream and Fort Collins, that is an actual local reservoir behind you. Yeah, this is Horsetooth Reservoir. I think technically it's outside the city limits, but it basically forms the uh, western edge boundary of the city. And if I uh, scoot out of the way here, uh -huh. uh, that is Horsetooth Rock. Oh, wow. And that's about 7,200 feet, if I remember correctly. And so a lot of times... We start down here, um, a little bit below the about the reservoir level in town at five thousand feet, and then pedal our bikes up there to wow. uh, seventy two hundred feet. <laughs> Dang, we have a local hill that I like to bike up, but it's nowhere near as uh, impressive mm -hmm. as that one. You, so your Twitter profile uh, for people who aren't familiar is Biker, Biker Glenn, showing off this enthusiasm. You said you actually have a a goal for this year, which is twenty five hundred <laughs> miles. 2,500 miles. So I'm about 50 miles short. So if I do two more laps around the reservoir, I'm there. Wow. <laughs> cool. Uh, so you have uh, all kinds of projects highlighted on your Twitter feed and beyond and on mm -hmm. your website, which is bikerglen.com. We thought we'd talk to you about some of these amazing things that you're developing. This newest one is a vintage. So what is a Grass Valley button panel? Is that just a company? So there's a company called uh, Grass Valley, and they make live production switchers. Um, mm. They've been used in use since the 70s for making uh, videos. So if you go into like a newsroom or a studio somewhere, they'll have these huge decks with tons of buttons. Wow! So what kind of inspired me was, do uh, you remember in uh, in uh, Star Wars in like 1970 something? There was a little lever they pulled to uh, blow up Alderaan on the Death Star. <laughs> oh my goodness! Look at that. So this Wait, one's no. about. Yeah. Whoa. So this one's uh, from Grass Valley. This is from a switcher from about 2005. Um, if you look at my Twitter feed, there's one with bright orange buttons. That one is from uh, 1985, and that one's much more similar to uh, to uh, the one that's actually used in Star Wars in this one. Wow, but, this uh, one? It's, uh, uh, or is it a little further down? It's probably way it's down. Way too much can... cool stuff on here, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, let me uh, – I think I can – Cut that I can over. get lost in here for there hours. Oh, there we go. So yeah. that's yeah. <laughs> so that's the one from uh, 1985 that wow. uh, is in uh, it's in a rack over the other side of the basement right now. That so. is so cool. And so, besides adapting existing, are you using this one as it was originally designed for, as for uh, show switching? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I'm using it as a Halloween prop. Um, huh. <laughs> so I guess two years ago, I, I so I have my zombie containment unit and I yeah. have a, uh, a monster in a box. I decided I needed something that looked kind of mad scientist laboratory. So I built up this rack with some Nixie tubes, some video, some old meters and some flashing lights. And I kind of decided that it was time to uh, build up another rack, which is where this... Uh, this uh, orange lever uh, from Grass Valley came in. Oh, and once that. I bought the first one, I was like, this is cool stuff. I think we can convert these to USB and make some really awesome input-output peripherals with them. <laughs> yeah, so. you're sort of this mastermind of creating USB uh, connected human input devices, which we'll take a look at in a second. But since you brought it up, uh, you mentioned your zombie containment unit, mm -hmm. which we've covered in the past, your monster in a box, <laughs> this is one of my favorite haunted house props, honestly, and uh, also controlling Halloween direction decorations mm -hmm. with DJ lighting hardware, as well as 
a power over the ethernet Christmas tree. So it clearly, like, you're a very festive person, it seems. <laughs> and I was wondering if you have anything uh, in this vein planned for the upcoming holiday season. Um, not really for this year. I think, um, you know, with the, the physical distancing and social distancing, it's it's a little tougher to actually it's impossible to uh, right. invite people over for, for parties or decorations. So I've put up a little bit of stuff outdoors that people can drive by and walk by, mm. you know, and keep distant. But um, I'm going to finish up that rack with the uh, Grass Valley Switcher for next year. And I'll probably try to come with one or two more props. Um, I think one of the spookier props uh, is the grave bell that they used to kind of bury, a, have a bell above a, uh, uh, oh, a grave yeah. and ring the bell. So I'm in case working they were on, buried alive by accident or something. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm working on one of those. So when you walk by at the <laughs> bell <will> ring. <laughs> <laughs> that is so creepy. I love it. So, uh, so 2021, Halloween 2021 is going to be spectacular. It's on. It's on. It's on. And I clearly have to make a road trip to Colorado. That sounds amazing. This year I saw actually someone made an amazing uh, lawn decoration that was they used – skeletons to recreate the 1966 gemini launch i think it was <laughs> <laughs> i All think right. you would love that one it's a bunch of like you know they actually recreated the control panels and everything oh wow yeah I'll super i'll have to look for that one on twitter lots of, sometime lots of good buttons i'll see mm -hmm. if i can drop you a link um yeah so speaking of human input devices mm -hmm. you've done a single escape key used usb keyboard you've done actually a um, oh 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 well, I'll save I'll save the caps lock one for later. <laughs> You've done one with three keys: one that does like Control Alt Delete, one that mm -hmm. does locks your screen, and one that does an Escape key. Uh, how did you first start making these? Yeah, what so, did you deal with them? I think what kind of started was that I found these uh, ginormous uh, oh, keycaps. This is my favorite <laughs> one. Where did you find uh, those? Uh, I think it's Novel Keys. Huh. Uh, novelkeys.xyz if my memory's working correctly. And um, so I built this and was like, well, this is this is great. You know, I can set this on my desk and it's almost like one of those, uh, you know, animal research projects where, you know, you light up the button and the, and the raccoon pushes the lit button and gets a treat. <laughs> I mean, it's kind Do of you exactly- you get a treat when you push it? No, no. Aww. I think there's some uh, some gummy bears upstairs, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, just pushing that thing seems like a treat in itself. Mm -hmm. it, it seems you were right about uh, novelkeys.xyz. <laughs> ah, cool. All that was fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was wondering, because you also have these this really cool little uh, escape guy key. And then on your three-button keyboard, you have, like, a cool lock mm -hmm. and power um Symbols yeah, so, and stuff. I was wondering if you have them yourself or you get them. Yeah, so this is um so this is the big one. I just said, well, let's see how small I can make it. So I came Ooh. up with this little tiny uh one key uh keyboard. <laughs> it's got a, I think it's a Cherry MX blue inside it. It's mm. got micro USB on this side. Um and you know, the one thing too that inspired me there was that uh I don't know his last name, but there's a guy named Mark at Microchip on Twitter. And uh, he told me that they have this little tiny PIC 16F 1459 part that doesn't require an oscillator. There's an internal oscillator inside it. And then to get the accuracy that's needed for uh, USB, huh. there's a little PLL clock recovery circuit that locks the internal oscillator to the, to the signal coming in over the USB wire. Huh. So with one chip and a decoupling capacitor and a, and a USB-C or micro USB jack, you can make a USB peripheral. Wow. Um, you know, no FTDI, no Cypress parts, just uh, one small chip that sells for like a dollar sixty-five quantity one. Dang! <laughs> uh, yeah, even just being able to order those in quantity one, it can mm -hmm. be a bit of a challenge. I was totally wondering what's what do you use inside of these? Do you have a favorite system? Do you usually use that same chip, or do you sort of vary it? Because some people use like the Teensy, uh, yeah, larger, obviously. So I've been on a kick with uh, 8-bit micros. So of course there's the microchip picks, like the 16F1459, but uh, Silicon Labs has a competing device, the EFM8UB1 huh. and the EFM8UB2. The UB1 is a little tiny bit physically bigger than this, than the pick. Um, it's got two or three, probably four or five, six more pins. And it's, but it's also 30 cents cheaper. It's like a dollar thirty-five, dollar forty quantity one. And then the UB2 is a much bigger part. Um, of course, PIC has their own uh, core 
the Silicon Labs parts are based on the old 8051 architecture. So they have an 8051 that might have ran at a megahertz back in the day, you know, 30, 40 years ago, whenever 8051s were popular. Oh, Today yeah. it runs at 48 megahertz. So uh, it's pretty dang fast. <laughs> wow. And it's the same thing. A few more decoupling caps. You need about four capacitors and the part. But then you have a USB device. And that USB device could be an input device like a keyboard. This one is an EFM8 based version of the of the, of the uh, one key. Or it could be. An, Does it light up? Uh, this one doesn't light up. I have a, a purely LED one. Ooh. So this has a little WS2812 in it. Uh -huh. So it can be red, green, or blue. Uh -huh. It looks like a serial port to the computer. And when you log into the terminal, you can type in commands like red, green, blue. Uh, it's just a little party light. Yeah, it reminds basically. me of the. The Blinkem uh, or Thingem that was a little USB. Uh, yeah, there's there's like Blink One or yeah 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 yeah, and then there's there's Luxafor and I think there there's one other uh, by a company called Fitlet. Um, hmm. All pretty cool devices. So you were asking about fabrication. Um, For sure. I, could, I don't own a 3D printer. I use a service bureau, and the nice thing about that is that you don't have to worry about supports and overhangs when you print, and Ooh, also. Yeah. When there's a 3D printing disaster, it's their problem. <laughs> email, your part's going to be a day late, but you're going to get what you ordered. Absolutely. Um, I've used, um, I think it was Shapeways for that reason before. Mm -hmm. Or 3D yeah. hubs. Exactly. I've been using um, Sculptio in France. Mm. Um, and they have um, the traditional SLS, the selective layer centering, in tons of colors. Like there's uh, red and blue. Ooh. Um but they also have a really nice material called uh, HP Multijet Fusion, which is a little firmer, and it can be. Uh, it normally Ooh. is kind of a gray color, but it can be dyed black as well. Um, That's so pretty. Thanks. And use that. You use that as like a volume knob, right? Yeah, this is a volume knob for my PC. This is one of the few things I've built that I use on almost a daily basis, mm. um, and it's got this nifty little kind of cut out surface here that's flat yeah. where the circuit board makes contact with the uh, interior of the enclosure. Wow, that's that's so stylish. Thanks. I didn't mean to distract you from talking about your materials and things. Yeah, well, the other material that is uh, that I really like is, uh, is aluminum. And, hmm. you know, it seems like it's only about 10 years ago that this stuff was affordable uh, to get made as a hobbyist, you know, actually have something custom CNC machine just for you. Yeah. Yeah, this one's for our little uh, analog panel meters. Oh yeah, <laughs> those are so cool. Yeah, so so using these these two little parts, the one from Microchip and the one from Silicon Labs, you know, you can make input devices like these keyboards that look like macro keyboards. You can make uh, multimedia devices like the volume knob here. Um, you can make output devices like the uh, <laughs> the analog panel oh. meters. <laughs> um, so and of course, one, you're using Oshpark for a lot of those circuit boards, it looks like. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a great service, you know. So there's there's tons of purple boards uh, <laughs> floating around here. <laughs> That's so rad. So being able to go into depth about the aspects of these different chips and things, it's apparent that you're not uh, a sort of everyday hobbyist, but you have this deep uh, technological background. You sent me this robot that you made before. You actually had this really interesting thread recently about these little uh, switches that you use for training robots, industrial mm -hmm. robots. And uh, they have these interesting properties where they have like multiple steps and mm -hmm. different ways of triggering them. So what, where do you, <laughs> you clearly have some kind of like professional industrial background. Can you tell us mm -hmm. about it? So I am a uh, chip designer, uh, previously at a little company called Scientific Atlanta before uh, they got bought by Cisco. Huh. And there I designed chips that are in cable television set-top boxes, cable modem head ends, as well as cable modems themselves. I did a lot uh. of uh, cryptography and multimedia work, huh. um, particularly on the audio DSP side of things. I left Cisco about two years ago and uh, joined Keysight Technologies where I am in their chip group that normally uh, uh, designs uh, chips for oscilloscopes. Uh, currently, I'm working on some radar target simulation chips uh, for testing autonomous vehicles. Radar target simulation chips? So yep. what are you, you're simulating a target? <laughs> yeah, so if, you're, um, so if you have a radar sensor and you wanna see how does my sensor compare 
rather than take that sensor out onto the road or out to, uh, you know, out somewhere or have someone walk towards your sensor, walk away uh -huh. from your sensor, um, we make products that you can basically park static in front of your sensor and it sends a signal in what? and sometime later it sends that signal out. And so it can mimic um, what it's happened. It's like the delay from, from a thing far away reflecting the radar? Yep. What? That's so mm -hmm. cool. Do you not, yeah. at the risk of, of diving into this too much, do you not also get a reflection off the object or is it designed to disrupt the radar signal that's actually returning from the, the object? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a digital engineer, so that's more oh, sure. of a question. <laughs> But um, have you seen these giant anech anechoic chambers that are used for uh, sound oh, yeah. testing? And I think you can basically put a pad of that up around the antenna. And so you don't actually see or you minimize the the uh, the visibility of the uh, the hardware that's that's mimicking this radar signal. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Or like that airplane. I always forget. Is it F-117 or what? The, yeah, the, the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber. Oh, it's so pretty. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So one of my coworkers saw oh. one of those flying over uh, Colorado Springs yesterday. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I've only seen them in aircraft museums, but they're, mm -hmm. they're super pretty. They are. It's sort of like the low poly aesthetic before it was a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of vehicles, you're obviously hugely into bikes. You have this miniature Wi-Fi bike traffic signal. I was always wondering if like there's other ways that you um, integrate your hobbies together. Like I love bikes as well, and mostly mm -hmm. all I do is just make bike lights that are mm -hmm. fancy. Uh, but you've made this. Have you done anything else with um, yeah, bringing together bikes and electronics? I I have not. Um, I I actually I never got around to integrating this, but um. Our uh, city used to, and our county used to use this Esri software um, for indicating if trails are closed or not. Huh. And it turned out when you clicked on a trail to find out if it was closed or not, it would send basically a JSON request back to the Esri survey, server. And the server would respond with trails open, trails closed. Why is it open or closed? And huh. so my goal was to be able to take that data and just change the, the color of the lights. And so once every hour or so, ping their server, ask what the state of the trails are. Uh, uh, the entire state of Colorado has since switched to a new system for uh, trail status. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know, I haven't really dug into it to see if there's an API or or what, if there's a REST interface or anything, a RESTful interface. Um, but that does give you a hint as to how big recreation is, that they finally got tired of having uh, piecemeal mm -hmm. indications of what trails are open and closed. So the whole state got together, the BLM, the Forest Service, all the counties, all the cities, oh, and wow. said, we're going to put our trail statuses on this one website, uh, Colorado Trail Explorer. If you Google that, it'll pop right oh, up. Oh, cool. So, yeah, we have a lot of uh, very forward initiatives in the state and in this county and in the city uh, in terms of connectivity, smart cities, uh, and making data available uh, to, the, to the population. It's a pretty cool place to live. Oh, that's rad. Especially, it seems like it's so easy for people to sort of jump on smart cities as like a kind of bandwagon thing. I mm -hmm. feel like that was kind of happening a while ago. But there are so many actual great applications for it. Uh, for example, like you know, telling if streetlights are out and things like mm -hmm. that. What else have they got going on up there? Uh, one that I just found out uh, the other day was that um, we have friction sensors on the roads. I didn't even know they made friction sensors. Huh. And these friction sensors determine the type of pre precipitation and how much precipitation it is. Uh. And all these friction sensors report back to, you know, this this snowplow readiness center. I don't know what the city calls it exactly. And based on the data from those sensors, that's how they decide where to deploy the snowplows first. And then the snow plows themselves report real time where they're out on the roads. And there's a map you can go to on the city's website and see what roads have been freshly plowed. Wow. And as the snow plows are doing this, they're collecting data about how much snow they're removing and oh, reporting wow. that back to, you know, the operations center. So the operations center can decide where to uh, move snow plows next. Um, this is this really has been done pre broadband and pre fiber network. So right now they're looking at what additional applications can the city get into uh, to, to run the city uh, more intelligently and smarter uh, with the fiber network versus relying on you know, relying on like old radio links and, and whatnot. Um, That's so good. Plus, I could see this being used uh, across multiple years. If you maintain the historical data, you could see mm -hmm. like which areas tend to need it. And also, like, what's the difference in snowfall? What's the difference in this pre precipitation over time? 
Exactly. And, and we wow. do have wide variations between the west side of town and the east side of town um, in huh. terms of snowfall. It's uh, pretty weird. Are you on like, are you nestled in between hills or are you sort of on a on a local maximum or minimum? Or So this hill behind me is kind of the last hill until you hit like eastern Kansas. Right. Wow. <laughs> it's basically uh, from, from here on out, it's about 5,000 feet all the way. I don't know, to the Kansas border somewhere, probably. Probably mm. well beyond the Kansas border. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, I did it's some high time plains. in Kansas. Yeah, it's high plains to the to the east of us. And then, you know, this mountain tops out around 7,000 feet. The next one over tops out over 14,000 feet. And we have 50 or 60 14ers, you know, that are over 14,000 feet in the state. Uh, um, yeah. So, <laughs> so Colorado. Kind of, yeah, Colorado. Um. There is, I wanted to make sure we have time to talk about this thing, which okay. is, uh, it's one of, so, you know, you'll see people building, even with the the new cutie pie from Adafruit, people are building sort of human input devices. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things designed for that. But this is one of the first, like, opposite ones that I've seen where it's not a button going into the computer. It's actually reading a mm -hmm. signal from the computer, which apparently, uh, according to uh, your write-up, is not actually something that's done inside the keyboard. It's a signal originated by the computer to tell uh, keyboards that caps lock is on. And you've sort of hijacked that to create this little buzzer that tells you that it's on and like you're yelling on the internet. Or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, ah, can you just tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure where I got the idea from, but I got tired of caps lock being stuck on or inadvertently hitting it. So I uh, went out and... Uh, and uh, came up with this idea. You know, I built the one key keyboard and I saw looking through the microchip example code that there were getting status reports back from the computer indicating that the scroll lock, uh, number lock and caps lock keys are on or not. That's so thought, cool. You know what? I can harness this to make a buzzer that tells me if caps lock is on, you know? Um, so I went ahead and built this, you know, and there's uh this is the newer version that has a bootloader and everything else. And and uh, then we made a video about it at work. Uh, I talked to Daniel Bogdanoff, who's our Scopes uh, marketing guy. And uh, he's like, we got to make a video about this. So we ended up making a 15, 20 minute long video uh, for the Keysight Labs YouTube channel. Uh, oh, that nice. got quite a bit of exposure. That was kind of a pleasant surprise. I didn't really expect that to happen at work, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never seen anything like this, but it's such a clear use case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so one thing that did change is Mac updated their operating system where it keeps track of a caps lock state per keyboard that's plugged in, I believe. Whoa. So this doesn't really work as well on the latest versions of the Mac OS, but oh. it still works great with Linux, Windows, and older Mac OS versions. That's I can't even fathom why you would want more than one keyboard plugged in, unless you have like one of your like uh, macro keyboards as well as a regular one. Yeah, I think the macro keyboard. You know, I I prefer the ten the ten keyless keyboards, so I don't have a, a number keypad. So if I want to type like a paragraph symbol or an alpha or a beta or a degree symbol or something. I don't have the number keys mm. to go <laughs> to go do the alt code on my on my computer. So I built a, a little uh, macro keypad so that I would have those available, those symbols available for technical documentation. So good. Uh, I can totally see why a Mac <laughs> would be the ones to do this because there's so much rage over their touch bars. I rage mm -hmm. over it constantly. <laughs> yep. um, You've also made some really beautiful projects. So, I mean, I think everything that you make has a certain aesthetic quality. It always looks very nice and finished. Uh, mm -hmm. you, 3D printed enclosures and everything. But also, look, just look at this. It's gorgeous. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff with USB, but I think my favorite interfacing technology is still Ethernet with power over Ethernet. Because you have one cable to plug in, you get mm. power, you get data, it's reliable, unlike wireless, I think. And then once something's on the network, you know, for good or for bad, anybody can talk to it. Um, so I'm really a big fan of Ethernet and particularly the power over Ethernet technologies uh, that enabled this clock. There you go. And, and these are one. so interesting because they're VFD tubes. Mm -hmm. well, they look like, it looks like your sort of standard Nixie tube project, but it's actually these seven segment displays. Yep. And one thing that I love about your process as well is that you have your um, bikerglen.com blog mm -hmm. for sort of your finished 
projects, but you also tend to sort of document stuff as you go on Twitter, which means that if people want to follow you, they'll get some of the earliest notifications about the cool new stuff that you're working on. Yeah, I think Twitter is kind of a rough draft slash first draft slash uh, getting my ideas organized uh, type of place. Makes sense. It's mm -hmm. sort of a lot more, it's free of the sort of mm, design constraints of like everything has to be nice and polished. This is mm -hmm. my write-up. This is how you do it. And it's more of like a, a free form medium. Definitely. Love it. So yeah, if you folks want to uh, check out more of Glenn's projects, you should absolutely follow him on Twitter, Biker Glenn. Uh, you can also check out bikerglenn.com. We also frequently cover your projects on the Hexter blog because they're so gorgeous. Uh, yeah, and thank you. I can't wait to see what else uh, you come up with. Is there anything you'd like to throw in or things that we didn't mention that you'd like to cover before we wrap up? Yeah, let's see if I can uh, make this transition here. Yes! Yeah, there's more of the Grass Valley stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness. So this one's completely written up on the blog. This one is, uh, this one right here um, is in progress of being written up on the oh, blog. And this one is uh, pretty cool because in addition to having these these Vtronics uh, uh, push button switch, which switches, which are actually read switches, it has this LCD display. And if you look at this LCD display, there's eight little windows. These are actually eight separate 32 by 32 um, matrices, all on one pane of glass what? that connect via three ribbon cables back to three controller ICs. That is so cool. What kind of ICs are you using? I have no idea what ICs <laughs> those are. <laughs> okay, cool. But somehow, after about three months of work and lots of time with the logic analyzer and uh, and USB stuff, I managed to figure out how to talk to the LCD, the backlights, change the tally lights, and get wow. the key key presses um, back into my computer to see what keys are being pressed. So that's probably the next thing to be written up on the blog. And you said those are read switches, so those are magnetically activated. What? Yeah, there, there's a little read switch in the bottom of the switch, and then there's a magnet in the plunger. And when you press the plunger, the magnet moves in proximity to the uh, read switch. The read switch closes. Uh, when the plunger gets pushed back out by the spring, the read switch opens up and the circuit's broken again. Um, wow. <laughs> I can't I can't let you go without looking at that that view some more. So there was this big red box that said something about for radio something, depress both buttons at once. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's uh what's going on there? <laughs> so I found this. I someone tweeted about this. I went to eBay. There was like this little BC765 model number on it. So I went to eBay and someone had like 50 of them for sale. I'm like, I've got to oh. have one. So I bought one. I bought one quick. This came out of, I think, a B1 bomber. And it was meant to destroy the friend or foe radio. Wow. So if your plane got shot down, you were supposed to push both of these buttons and that would uh, set off an explosive charge that would destroy the radio uh, somewhere in the plane. So that so, someone couldn't like spoof being one of your friendlies? Exactly. Wow. Uh, kind of like the CRM114 discriminator in uh, in a Dr. Strangelove, you know, but you push the two buttons and the CRM114 blows up. Oh my goodness, I totally <laughs> have forgotten about that part. I need to rewatch that. It's a great movie. Oh, it's so, so. good. As long as you don't have to like climb down and like manually release the the bay door. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anything else in that little view? It, I feel like I I wasted my time not looking at this more. Oh. I, oh. I've got some interesting joysticks. You know, they look like uh, toggle switches, but in reality, it's a four axis uh, joystick. What? Or a two axis joystick? It's uh, pull the little cover off here. But if you look closely with the cover off, it is actually. Oh. Uh, there we go. <laughs> it's actually a joystick, even though it looks like a toggle switch. Interestingly, it's diagonal joystick, not like up, down, left, right, like I would expect. Yeah, so you have to put it in the panel at a 45 degree angle. What? <laughs> so, That's so weird. So this was another eBay find where I um, I saw a panel when I was looking probably for this thing. I uh, saw a panel out of uh, M1 Abrams tank. And I looked at it and I saw this little joystick looking thing and I eventually tracked down the manufacturer and and then found one for sale for cheap on eBay. It's like $25 used on eBay. I wrote the company that makes them, they're $150 quantity one. <laughs> Boy. And you wanted a new one. So I'm like, I'll go with eBay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then finally, 
I did also notice one of them has a bunch. You have a little uh, macro looking keyboard with a bunch of Greek letters on it. Is that actually for are those sort of intended to be stand ins for whatever or do they actually signify like ohms and stuff? Those actually are the uh, the labels that the the keys make when you press them on the computer. This is my huh. scientific documentation oh, keypad. That's brilliant. I need and, that. And the chroma key green on the on the keys <laughs> is uh, <laughs> transparent. Yeah, that's Normally good. The keys are green. They're not reservoir colored. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little bit of that with one of the circuit boards earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Oh. Well, I'm so glad that we got to dive into that a little bit. Uh, we'd love to have you back on anytime. Everyone, follow Biker Glenn on Twitter. Uh, check out, of course, bikerglenn.com. Follow hexer.io slash news uh, to get all the, the all the latest ones that are written up. But again, I can't wait to keep seeing uh, your stuff pop up on Twitter from now and uh, from time to time. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a, an absolute delight. Thank you, Alex. My pleasure being here. All right. Cheers. Cheers.